now that you know a lot of the basic principles of behavioral economics, and you've studied a little bit about how to design experiments, you might want to think about topics with which you could actually apply some of these skills. And if you wanted to identify topics that you could apply these skills to, you need to go no further than your local newspaper. Today's newspaper, for example, has stories on a lot of things that have relevance to us as behavioral economists. There's a story on why people don't save as much as we think they should. There's a story on unhealthy eating. There are stories on why people don't donate to charities. There are stories about the fact that people generate too much trash, including items that they could put in the recycle bin. And finally, there are lots of stories about self-control more generally, uh, and more specifically as it applies to the workplace and procrastination. A number of years back, when I was searching for topics to work on, that is exactly what I did. I looked at issues in the newspaper, I looked at topics that I think I could apply a lot of these skills to, and much of my work in the area of consumer credit, in the area of goal setting, uh, bridging the gap between intentions and actions, was born out of simply identifying a lot of real world problems, and then seeing what tools I have at my disposal to address those problems. When I started doing my research, I worked with a number of different kinds of organizations. I worked with government organizations, not-for-profits, NGOs, and for-profit companies. And I was struck by one interesting fact. A lot of these organizations had an economic advisor. None of them had a behavioral advisor. And the reason this struck me as odd was that at the end of it, the heart of every single problem that we just talked about was to change the behavior of the end user, be it getting somebody to set aside the extra $10 per week, or switching off their air conditioning in the summer, or making sure they replace that chocolate cake with a healthy helping of fruit. Perhaps the one book that changed the fact that companies and organizations like governments started looking towards the behavioral sciences was, of course, the book that we've talked a lot about, Nudge, by Dick Taylor and Cass Sunstein. It's not been about five years since this book came out. And one of the questions that I get asked a lot is, has the world really changed as a result of Nudge? Have the principles that have been enshrined in the book started to influence the way in which governments and policymakers and welfare architects have gone about doing their work. And what I'd like to do in the next little bit is to review some of the key ideas from Nudge and as well talk about how these have actually made an impact in the world today. Let's start off by reminding ourselves about the four different strategies of behavioral change that we've talked about in week one. We said initially that one common strategy for governments in which to influence behavior change is simply to impose restrictions or constraints on what people can choose. Alternatively, the economic approach is to offer incentives, uh, either a positive incentive through a, uh, a reward program, a negative incentive, which could be a tax. Uh, third option is a marketing approach, persuasion. Give people information, persuade them, convince them that they should choose the preferred course of action. Uh, and the fourth strategy, of course, that we talked about was the nudging or the choice architecture strategy, where you simply make it easy for people to accomplish the desired choice. Now, we've got to be careful about making sure that we do not fall into the trap of thinking that these four strategies are mutually exclusive, that we should simply be nudging while ignoring the other strategies. This is not a story about nudging versus the other three strategies. It is a story about how we can best utilize the right combination of these strategies in behavior change. Let's look at a simple example. In 2009, the city of Toronto, like many other cities all over the world, decided to impose a small fee for the use of plastic bags in grocery stores and supermarkets and department stores all across the city. Plastic bags starting 2009 were gonna cost five cents per bag with the idea that they would discourage people from asking for plastic bags and as a result, build a culture of using reusable cloth bags when they went ahead and did their grocery shopping. Is this an economic strategy to change behavior, or is there more to it? On the face of it, five cents seems like a punishment, a tax, for following the undesirable behavior. When you think about it a little bit more carefully, though, it soon emerges that it's not the fact that it is five cents that matters, but the fact that there is a payment to be made at all that matters. In other words, if you replaced five cents with 10 or with two, I suspect you would have still gotten the same effect. 
it isn't the fact that the, the amount of payment changes, it is the fact that there is a payment in the first place. We've done a number of experiments in India. We, we were trying to get people in the rural parts of the country uh, to consume financial advice. And our initial response based on economic theory was, if you give advice for free, it is more likely to be consumed. We found the opposite effect. We actually found that if you had people make small payments for advice, they were much more likely to follow through on that advice. But here's the interesting fact. It didn't matter how much they paid. In one condition, they paid five rupees. A second condition, 10 rupees. A third condition, they paid nothing. And the consistent finding we found was that people who had paid five or 10 rupees were much more likely to follow through on the advice as compared to people who had paid nothing. Uh, difference between paying five and 10 was not significant. The point I want to make here is that while an element of financial incentives or economic incentives have been used to get people to change behavior, we could strengthen that particular intervention by thinking through a behavioral contribution to that. Now, let's think about a few other examples where uh, there are differences between uh, an economic approach to changing behavior versus a behavioral approach to changing behavior. A lot of times, we find in the, in the field of energy conservation, for example, that increasing prices does not have a significant effect on the consumption of electricity. Why does that happen? It happens in situations where households typically pay their energy bills by direct debit from their bank accounts. So a lot of people actually don't see the increased price that they pay. And for the ones that do, they don't feel its impact. It's a mental accounting story. If my average monthly expense is $42 per month, and I now pay 10% more, it goes from 42 to 46 or 47, it is still a $50 kind of expense. In other words, it falls in the same mental bracket in my head, and as a result, there is no effect on consumption. But on the other hand, think about a simple strategy where you look at people who make a payment for a certain consumption and fail to make that consumption. Remember this example? Here's where we looked at the ski tickets. In one condition, uh, we had a four-day ski ticket, which was framed as a single unit, $160 for four days. A second condition, four separate tickets of $40 each. Let's replace ski tickets with something that you want people to consume. Let's imagine you uh, are in the business of providing insurance plans. You notice that your plan that covers a free annual checkup, or, or a checkup that's included, as part of the plan, uh, results in very low take-up rates. Most people who are entitled to a checkup do not get it. Suppose you gave them tickets that look like this one. So suppose you actually gave them a ticket which made salient to them the fact that they had actually prepaid for an annual checkup. Chances are high that they would actually go and consume the checkup. Here's an example of a situation where you have an economic component, the fact that people pay a price, but the strength of that economic component has been increased by simply changing a behavioral factor, i.e. the way in which the tickets are presented. So in other words, you could think about the effectiveness of one specific kind of strategy, be it a nudging strategy, be it a economic strategy, be it a persuasion strategy, that is affected or changed by the presence of a second strategy. In experimental language, we're gonna call this an interaction effect. The, the presence of an economic strategy can be strengthened by simply crossing it with a second behavioral or a nudging approach. So when we think about these four approaches, it is easy to see that the best approaches actually use a combination of these four factors. Over the past five years, many governments and not-for-profit organizations all over the world have begun to embed nudging into the way they go about doing policy and welfare initiatives. In particular, the United Kingdom, the United States, Denmark, and other examples from countries like Singapore, Hong Kong, and India, as well as Canada, have now begun to illustrate that nudging is truly here to stay.